I wouldn't normally share my diary with anyone. I was in two minds whether or not to take it with me to uni at all, to be honest. Just in case one of my new flatmates found it, and it became some kind of running joke around campus. I had visions of it doing the rounds on WhatsApp, which wouldn't exactly have been the best start. In the end, I compromised. Instead of writing in longhand like I did back at home, I typed it all up on my laptop. Now, I'm glad I did. It's going to make this whole thing easier. Now, rather than going through a notebook and typing up the weird stuff that happened since I've moved into halls, I can just copy it across here. I'm hoping someone here can help me make sense of it. I've tried talking to my housemates a couple of times about it all, but every time, they've either made fun of me, or think I'm making fun of them. Individually, the entries I've posted might not mean much, but I have this weird feeling there's something else, some bigger picture I might be missing. I know I need to do something anyway. My sleep lately has been worse, and ever since I found that letter shoved under the door. But no, now I'm getting ahead of myself. One thing at a time. The diary has to come first, or the letter won't make sense. Below are entries I made over the past two months, since I first moved into the halls. I've cut out as much of my random waffling as possible to try and keep the focus on the parts I think are relevant. Here goes. October 6th, 2018 I'd always heard people say student halls aren't exactly luxury, and if there's one thing today has taught me, it's this. They weren't lying. On the sliding scale of palace to crap hole, my room probably clocks in at a solid three. It's got all the basics. Desk, bed, walls, a cobweb riddled ceiling. But aside from that, there's not a whole lot going for it. I could almost visibly see my mum shudder when we walked through the door earlier. Still, I don't know what else I was expecting. Of all the student accommodation available, this is the cheapest by an absolute mile. It's partly the location. We're a 30 minute walk from town, right on the outskirts. Partly the fact this particular student village is famous, or infamous I should say. Last November, it made headlines because of that kid who went missing. And even though most people think he probably just did a runner, Apparently, he had a drug problem. It does seem to have cast this weird cloud on the place. That cloud is noticeably in the price. About £50 less than most other places. And the fact that it's sort of a ghost town. Only four of the six rooms in my flat are occupied. I joked to my mum that I should have asked for the missing kids room. Maybe they'd have knocked even more money off. But she didn't laugh. Anyway, you'd think the university might have made a special effort with these halls, because nobody wants to live here. But no such luck. My room barely even looks like it's been cleaned. Along with the cobwebs and the threadbare carpet, we even found some graffiti. Someone, maybe whoever lived in the room last year, had scrawled some stick men on the wall behind my bed. Mum spotted them when she was sorting my duvet out for me. Still, it's no big deal. With the bed made and pushed up against the wall, you can't even see them. October 10th. I sort of wish my room wasn't on the ground floor. It's at the back of our block, facing the forest our student village stands on the edge of. I thought that'd be good at first. Quieter, decent view from the window, etc. But now, I'm not so sure. It's creepy, to be honest. There's no problem during the day. It's actually quite nice being able to look out at the trees while I'm on my laptop. The night is different. I can occasionally hear shouts and laughter in the distance when people come back from the SU. But apart from that, it's silent. You'd think that would mean I'd sleep well. But it doesn't. Maybe I'm a bit homesick, 
Or maybe it's just my body still getting used to this crappy mattress. But I've found myself waking up a lot in the night. It's ridiculous. I'm 18 now. I haven't been scared of the dark since I was a little kid. But a couple of times lately, I've woken up and found myself not wanting to look out the window. Dumb, I know. It's just that I can imagine all the trees that mark the edge of the forest not too far from my room, and I can picture the shadows between them. Sometimes, at 2am, it's not so hard to imagine that someone might be standing among those shadows. I know what the problem is. I've been speaking to John too much. He's the guy in the room across from me. Nice enough, if a little odd. Long hair in a ponytail, death metal t-shirts, doesn't leave his room all that much. Anyway, we got chatting in the kitchen the other day, and the topic of that kid came up. The one who went missing last year. The thing is, John says, it wasn't just one kid. He says, he's looked it all up on the internet, and there was actually a girl who also went missing from this block a couple of years before that. She went on a night out, and no one saw her again. That's not all either. John says these halls must be cursed or something, because there have been four suicides in the last few years alone. I have no idea about the statistics or anything, but that has to be higher than average, right? October 19th. 3 a.m. I woke up needing to pee, and now I can't get back to sleep. I have the blind on my window down, and I keep getting this weird urge to lift the edge up so I can peek through the crack, just to double check. There won't be anyone out there, I know that. There never is. But at the same time, I don't know that. Do you know what I mean? The best way I can describe it is like that feeling you get when someone tells you not to look at something, and then all you want to do is look. A part of my mind knows there won't be anyone standing out there by the tree line. But another part of my mind, the part that keeps whirring and doesn't want to let me sleep, is telling me that I can't know for certain unless I peek out. Anyway, I'm trying to distract myself. Maths always used to send me to sleep at school, so I'm hoping it might do the trick this time. What I'm trying to work out are the odds, the probability, or whatever you want to call it, that my room used to belong to one of those kids, the one that either went missing or killed themselves. I know it's grim, but I guess what John told me last week has stuck in my head. Besides, it's better than just sitting here doing nothing. There are six rooms in my flat, and there are four flatmates in our house. This student village is the smallest the university offers. Only four houses, set out in a little quad shape, so that's six by four by four. Ninety-six rooms in total. According to John, over the past three years, two kids have gone missing and four have killed themselves. I don't know exactly what happened when, so I'm just going to go with an average of two a year. That's two out of 96, all of which means there's a one in 48 chance that my room, the room I'm in right now, actually belonged to one of them. I guess those are pretty low odds. And I guess that should make me feel better, but it doesn't. October 20th. I don't know what the hell to do. It's four in the morning and I can't call my mom because she'll freak out. My flat is quiet and the only light on is in John's room. But I don't feel like I know him well to wake him. What would I say? Oh hi John, I know it's four in the morning and I've only known you for three weeks. But I just got back from a night out and I'm pretty sure there's somebody outside my room. Would you mind coming and checking for me? No way. At first, I thought about going out and finding the campus security guard, 
but I don't even know if he'll still be working at this time. Besides, let's be honest, he wouldn't believe me. I've just come back from a club and I probably stink of vodka. If I do find him and tell him I'm worried because I think I might have seen someone standing on the edge of the forest, he'll think one of two things. Either that I'm drunk and imagining it, or that I just saw some other drunk student out there. Someone who decided to go and explore the woods on a dare or summer. I don't think I'll be able to convince him what I'm now sure of, that I did see someone out there. And it wasn't just a random student. It was someone watching my flat. It happened as soon as I got home. First, I went to the kitchen to get myself a pint of water and a slice of leftover pizza. And then I got back to my room and the blind over my window caught my eye. It looked crooked, like it hadn't been rolled down straight or the bottom had caught on the windowsill or something. I went over to straighten it, and that's when I had the urge to peek out again. It was the same as last night. I knew there wouldn't be anyone out there, but I wanted to look anyway, just to make sure. This time was different though. I guess because I'd had a few drinks, rather than hesitating, I just leaned over and did it. Wrenched the blinds to the side in one quick motion, the light was on in my room, and I had to press my face close to the glass to see out. Someone was standing in the shadow of the tree line. They were about 50 meters or so away from my window, stood completely still. Just a silhouette. I couldn't make out any features in the murk. Here's the thing though. What I knew in that moment, and what I still believe now, even as I'm starting to sober up, is that the person in the shadows was staring back at me. I couldn't see their face or make out any features, but I could just tell. They were standing there in the darkness, watching my window, maybe even waiting there for me to peek out at them. I stared for a moment, probably in shock, and then... I backed away from the window so fast, I almost knocked over my desk chair. It took me a long time after that to work up the courage to look out the window again. I had this horrible idea that if I did, the figure wouldn't be over by the tree line anymore. They'd be standing directly on the other side of the glass, staring in. They weren't though. When I finally did work up the courage to look out, just before I started writing this, there was no sign of anybody. Damn, I don't know. Maybe I did just imagine it. November 6th. I think someone's playing a prank on me. They must be. At first, I thought it was the group of guys that lived two flats above, who I've been hanging out most with over the past couple of weeks, just doing it for a laugh because I told them the story about the person I thought I saw outside my room a couple of weeks back, trying to have a bit of fun with me. The thing is though, they're all denying it. After I confronted them, I kept waiting for one of them to crack and come clean, but they haven't. They just listen and look confused, and then I catch them stealing glances at each other, as if they think I'm starting to lose it. Maybe I am. That's probably the most likely scenario, that I'm homesick and I'm going stir crazy and it's making me overthink every little weird thing that happens. I don't know. What I do know is that the stuff I found in the ceiling above my bed is real. It's all on my desk and there's no denying it or trying to trick myself into thinking I didn't really see it like I've been trying to do with a figure in the trees. I made the discovery yesterday afternoon. I was working on my Shakespeare essay in my room at the time, but I wasn't really getting anywhere with it. My mind kept wandering, and I couldn't concentrate. I ended up lying down on my bed and staring up at the ceiling, 
trying to force myself to think about the role mental illness plays on Macbeth. I must have been there for about five minutes before I saw it. The rooms in our halls have these crappy panelled ceilings that look like they were built about a hundred years ago, and over near the middle of my room, I saw that one of the panels had come loose. I thought at the time it must have been the guy in the floor above me stomping around or something, but now I'm not so sure. Anyway, the panel had twisted slightly, so there was a gap near the corner, a dark slither, opening up onto whatever no man's land exists between the building's floors. The sight annoyed me. I hate it when there's something a little bit skewed out of place like that and I immediately had the urge to get up and fix it. I couldn't reach the panel from my bed, so I ended up dragging my desk chair into the middle of my room and balancing on it. As I reached up to straighten the panel though, I had another one of those dumb urges. I wanted to have a peek up above the ceiling, just out of curiosity. I'm sure humans have been having urges like this since our species first evolved, and I'm equally sure more than a few million of us have probably died from it. In the moment, I didn't care though. I had my iPhone in my pocket, and all I wanted to do was pop the torch function on and give the space above my ceiling a quick sweep. Now, I wish I hadn't looked. I found human hair up there. Not just a couple of strands either, or one of those weird balls where a bunch of it gets clumped together. What I found was two neat locks, each bound up with a hair tie, one dark, one blonde. That wasn't the only thing I found either. Some weirdo, probably one of the guys two flats above, it has to be them, had hidden this weird doll thing up there. Not like a doll you can buy in the shops, I don't mean that, more like something homemade. A jagged little figure bound together with the type of twigs you'd be able to collect in the forest near our halls. I took the hair and the dolls down from the ceiling, because the thought of them up there was creeping me out. Now they're on my desk, sitting next to me as I type this. I don't want them there either though. Just the sight of them in my peripheral vision is making me feel a bit ill. I think after I finish writing this, I'll take them outside and dump them in one of the big rubbish bins by the reception area. Maybe after that, I'll give John a knock. If it wasn't the guys upstairs who hid this weird stuff in my ceiling, maybe he knows something about it. It wouldn't surprise me if I'm honest. I walked into the kitchen the other day and the guy was sat at the table, reading a book about serial killers. He's weird. November 15th. Another bad night. I nearly ended up writing this at 3 in the morning again, but this time I managed to force myself to go back to sleep. Eventually. I kept getting close to drifting off, and then I keep jerking awake again thinking I could hear tapping. That's what woke me this time, I'm sure of it. I was having this dream, more of a nightmare really, where I was trapped in bed, staring up at the ceiling. I wanted to get up, but I couldn't. I couldn't even move my head. My eyes were fixed on the ceiling tile in the middle of my room, and as I stared at it, I could see that it was starting to move, just a shift to one side, ever so slowly. There was a noise coming from behind that tile, a sort of rattling sound, soft at first, then more insistent. I was opening my mouth to scream when I jerked awake. My duvet was all twisted and sweaty, and my heart was hammering in my chest. My eyes immediately shot to the panel in my ceiling, but even in the darkness, I could see it was still in its usual place. Of course it was in its usual place. I'd been dreaming. 
I knew I'd been dreaming, and it took me a few seconds to realize why the feeling of dread in my stomach was still sitting there like a stone. Then, I heard the rattling sound, this soft, insistent patter. The ceiling panel above might have been a part of my dream, but the noises weren't. Only now, as I listened, I realized it wasn't really a rattling sound at all. It was more of a tapping. A gentle drum, drum, drum. Like fingers on a table. I sat up in bed. For a second, my half-asleep mind made me believe the tapping must be coming from my door. That one of my flatmates was knocking for some reason, trying to wake me up. Then I realized... That wasn't right. The tapping wasn't coming from the ceiling, and it wasn't coming from the door either. It was coming from behind me. From my bedroom window, I froze. My heart was going double time in my chest, and my skin felt hot cold. And I swear, in that moment, I was even more scared than I'd been when I thought I saw the figure outside, standing among the trees. I knew I had to peek behind the blind, but I didn't know how I'd be able to bring myself to. For a moment, I seriously considered going and knocking on one of my flatmate's doors. I was that freaked out. But as I twisted out of bed and put my feet on the carpet, whether to check the window or leave my room, I still hadn't decided. The tapping stopped. Ten minutes later, when I finally worked up the courage to lift the edge of my blinds, there was no one there. Only the darkness and the trees. November 22nd. I need to try and drink less when I go out. Two for one double vodka and cokes will be the death of me, I swear it. Last night I was so smashed, I don't even remember getting back to the flat. The evidence was there this morning, though. My room was a mess. Clothes strewn all over the floor, as if I'd been burgled. I'm lucky I wasn't, too. In my drunken state, I managed to completely forget to lock my own door. I have a half-memory, something that might have even been a drunken dream, of waking up in the early hours with a pain in my head. Not a headache, like I've got today but more of a sharp sting, like a pinprick. Next time, I think I'll stick to the singles, or at least skip the Jaeger bombs. Well, thanks for taking the time to go through this. I know the diary entries go on a bit. Reading it all out has actually been sort of therapeutic though, in a way, because it's made me realise I might not need your help after all. Sitting here in the afternoon, reading this at my desk with the sunlight streaming in through my window, I actually feel kind of silly posting it at all. Because when you look at all the evidence together, the answer's obvious, isn't it? The whole thing is a prank. It must be. The only thing I'm still not sure of is who is behind it. John, or the guys who live two floors above me? I'd have to speak to them all again and get to the bottom of it. Whoever it is, they deserve some kudos. The letter I found shoved under my door yesterday really is quite impressive. I have to admit, it freaks me out a bit at first. It's very well done. The person behind it has to be someone who's been in my room at some point too. They even added a little stick man to the bottom of the paper which is a pretty accurate copy of the ones my mum discovered on the wall behind my bed back when I first moved in. I'll read out the letter exactly as I found it. Don't spend too much time agonising over it like I did though. It's clearly just gibberish. To the occupier of flat 1, room 6. You are in my old room. I thought I would write you this note to make sure you're treating it well. It's a special room and you have the key. That's a rare gift. 
It's your gift now. Something to cherish. Some people take pride in their car, or their face, or their hair. I take pride in my collections. The main thing I've been collecting for the past three years is keys. Your key might be my favourite yet. Did you know a key is to a room what a soul is to a person? One lives in the other. One grants access to the other. It's like a row of china dolls. To get the person, you need the soul. To get the soul, all you need is the smallest part of the person. A bloodstained likeness. A lock of hair. Anything. I keep my keys in a box. And I'm the only one who knows how to unlock it. See you soon. I don't know if you know this, but if you're a student and aching for some money, freelancing as a music journalist is a reasonably sweet deal, especially if you focus on concerts. The workload is manageable, you see a lot of bands you wouldn't otherwise, and even though the payment isn't too great, it's alright for what you're doing, plus you usually get some pretty good seats for concerts. You need a bit of luck to get into it, but if you manage to do so, I can only recommend you give it a shot. Back when I did it, I wrote for a small magazine, which had a focus on the alternative sides of music. Given my musical taste, I was mostly panelled to attend gothic and heavy metal shows, which honestly were a lot of fun. Those are, of course, all the Marilyn Manson and Metallica knockoffs, but a lot of experimentation is going on even though few of them actually got anywhere. I covered everything, from cover bands to experimental stuff that never made it big. I mostly saw them when they were well known enough to be worth writing about, but still kind of underground. Some of the bands got quite far actually, and one of the bands I wrote about you probably know, if you're into metal. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Back then, they sucked, let me tell you. Other bands were far more interesting. Sometimes, there's experimental bands. The kind of band that defies the traditional lineup. Maybe uses three guitars or two drums. Maybe doesn't have a singer, or decides to skip the bass guitar in favour of a taiko drum. Yes, that happened. They can be hit or miss, really. And most of it depends on the execution and dedication of the band in question. And then, there's the really weird stuff. Bands who don't just defy tradition, but outright crush every notion you have about music. These never make it big, but they make for a good article, and you can always one-up those hipster friends of yours. Whenever someone claims to have seen something, quote, like I've never even thought about, I usually tell them about the one time I saw a band that made music using old tape recorders and rubber bands or had lyrics written in a language that they invented themselves and instead of CDs, sold booklets about how to learn said language. I never tell them about Gunpo though, and I never will. That band haunts me. This was shortly before I intended to quit this job anyway since my final exams were coming up, and I wouldn't have the time or the need to work on the side. But still, I had some concerts I had promised to attend, and while I knew I should start studying for my exams, a bit of fun couldn't hurt, I reasoned. I had made a habit about researching the bands I would cover next, so that I'd know what to expect. After all, if I expected somber music to peacefully fantasize to, and got thrash metal that inspired mosh pits, that would tarnish my reviews. Also, I'd have to dress the part. Ever tried getting into a gothic club dressed in metal attire? You get in, but some of the looks you get could kill small animals. But I digress. The odd thing was, nothing really turned up for Gunpo. Their logo looked like the archetypical black metal shtick, barely readable and that's the way they wanted it, obviously. They played in a small club, not far from where I lived, 
that was known to host some of the more hardcore bands and regularly had people roughing each other up. But that was it. No set list, no albums. Even those underground sites I usually used for reference when all else failed was sparse with information. Well, no matter. They probably had their first real gig and knew the owner or something. All the better to milk it for a bit of extra cash if they turned out to be decent. A true diamond in the rough. So I went in my usual hardcore metal outfit to the club. Inside the club, the usual crowd had gathered. Metalheads of every colour, from the large, bulky types to lanky and acne-ridden. Long hair was prevalent, of course, as was the smell of beer, whiskey, and questionable hygiene. Not many women in sight, and those few who were seemed to have a full flock of bodyguards. I went and got myself a beer to hide myself up while I inspected the stage. Gumpo was set to play in about half an hour, so I had plenty of time to observe their lineup. Nothing too special, though. A set of drums, the drum bass showing the same indecipherable lettering that had come up during my research, two guitar stands, one microphone, everything hooked up and ready to go. From the way the guitar stands and the microphone were arranged, I figured they'd have a bass guitarist, a guitarist, and a singer who focused on singing, not playing the guitar on the side. Already an important observation to make beforehand, since this would make him able to engage more with the crowd. Always a good thing to have. I asked around, but the more I did, the more I understood. Nobody in here knew the band. Sure, some had done a bit of research like me, but they had found about as much or less. They were curious, however, or just didn't care about the band that was about to play. This reassured me about my theory that Gumpo probably knew the owner of the bar or someone close to them and was using this location to test the waters. Not the worst move. If they wanted a tough crowd, they'd certainly find it here. This location was known to attract a certain breed of metalhead. The kind that isn't opposed to a mosh pit going a little out of hand, if you know what I mean. Lost in thought about this, I only realized that the lights had dimmed as someone pushed me aside to get a better glimpse at the stage. The background music had ceased as well. All I could hear was excited muttering and scrambling. The first thing I noticed when the band entered the stage was the singer. He had to be the singer, really, because every other position would not suit him. He outshone the other band members up to the point that I cannot even remember them too vividly, as I was captured by him. The drummer, I remember, was of Indian descent, but otherwise, I remember little. The singer was huge. Face to face, he would have towered me in my 6'1 frame. But on stage, he looked even bigger than that. He was very heavily built too, with a prominent belly and round face. His skin was almost the colour of soot and had a look about it that I can only describe as coarse. He didn't seem to sweat. His skin is dry as a dune. But the thing that really set him apart was his smile. When he got up to the microphone, he smiled at the crowd like he wanted to swallow them up and his teeth seemed like those of a shark, fit for the job of devouring an entire crowd to fill that enormous belly. The band had already taken their positions, but the usual hollers and cheers did not start. You could have heard a fly buzzing. Nobody even daring to move like the first one to capture the attention of the mighty singer would be the first to quench his hunger. But then, the music started. And man, when I mean it started, it really started. There was no warm-up, no lame-ass introduction, no one, two, three, four, accompanied by the smacking of drumsticks. They simply started their first song and it began with a deep, guttural howl 
that I cannot compare to any other singer out there, for that would be unfair to them. You can train your voice all you want, but you'll never come near the sound of an earthquake. Gumper's lead singer, however, did, and I could feel the ground rumble under my feet as he drew out his growl that the band carried with their instruments into a fast-paced composition that instantly turned the crowd from awestruck to whipped into a frenzy, a mosh pit erupting well before the second verse. I never did write that article on Gumpa, but if I had, it would have read something like this. Even after only two songs, Gunpo already had the audience where other bands take a whole evening to get them. They are going wild, dripping with sweat, and shoving each other around whatever room they have. Nobody is staying still. Everything moves to their rhythm. Gunpo is pure, exemplified brutality, and I say this with the utmost respect. Few people can convey emotion through music, but Gunpo can. And what they convey is dominant, absolute rage. When the second song faded, the crowd was exhausted. They had gone at it like I had only seen a few times before or since, shoving, punching and kicking like they were on a battlefield. Someone had a bloody nose, but no one paid attention to it, not even the guy himself. The song faded out with a last cymbal crash and the crowd exploded in cheers and shouting. Just then, the singer raised his hand. Thank you all for coming. His voice was deep, slow, but I think everyone in the room could hear him as clearly as if he was standing right beside them. We are Gunpo, your band for this evening. You may address me as Dukkha, and we are here to cleanse the world of what we perceive is evil. Again, the crowd was almost silent. This was the usual black metal stuff I was used to hearing by now. We are the messiahs of metal, blah blah blah. It works if you're really into the band, but otherwise, well, a few months later, it always just sounds pathetic, even if you were really into it. A show act, nothing more. But the way Ducker said it, still sounded real to me. He didn't say it for show, nor did he want to make himself understood. He just said what was important to the band, as matter-of-factly as if he was reading the wiring for their setup. And we will start with all of you. You will be given the gift of absolution by violence kick-ass title, I thought, but I did not laugh. Nobody did. Nobody even rolled their eyes. They looked at Ducker like he was the demagogue, speaking on behalf of something they would never understand, but that he could make them serve. Well, I had been right about one thing. Absolved by violence was a kick-ass title. It was slower than the two that had came before it, but the raw energy it exuded filled the air like pheromones. The mosh pit became almost fanatical, and now there wasn't just one guy with a bloody nose, but several. People stopped helping each other up. They didn't just use their shoulders anymore, but their foreheads, hands and elbows. I managed to dodge a particularly large guy who tried to shove me into the crush barrier which could have easily gone wrong. Just when I got my balance back, I found myself opposite the wall. A wall made of humans, interlocked and ready to go. I took a step back and bumped into another wall. Two walls of people, slowly withdrawing from one another, leaving me stranded in between them like Moses when he parted the Red Sea 
I knew a wall of death when I see one, and as absolution by violence grew slower and slower still, so too did the withdrawal of those two people walls. I felt naked, exposed, like a tree just before a lightning bolt hits it. The sudden crash of the drums and the yawping of the guitar hit me just seconds before the wall did. I was crushed like an insect between two avalanches of skin, muscle and anger. People descended on one another like barbarians, sheer anger in their eyes. All the while, Gumpa was still playing, louder and angrier than ever. Someone next to me fell and disappeared under the plethora of boots. I don't know what happened to them, and I pray to God they're alive. But I honestly don't think so. Somewhere, a guy screamed in what was obviously excruciating pain. But he was quickly drowned by the music, his cry silenced under another verse. I don't know what made me, of all people, keep a sober mind, but I somehow managed to get through the horde of people lashing at each other like mad and out of the club. I never went back there. From what I know, the club closed shortly after, and I would never mention its name again. Gunpo has disappeared from the scene too, for all I know, if they even existed in the first place. Maybe this was all just a bad dream, accumulated from exam-induced stress. But I can still feel where those masses ran into me. Even though it has been years. It was a rainy Friday evening when I hit the dirt roads that lead up to my usual hiking trail. The week had been long and work had been stressful. I wanted nothing more than to escape into the wilderness for the whole weekend and that's what I had set out to do. I wasn't a big hunter of any kind really, though there had been the occasional outing where I actually had brought my hunting equipment up. Always found it difficult to actually pull the trigger when the time came. This particular outing, I would brought some stuff with me but only because I knew I wanted to try and stay until Sunday evening. My camping equipment was all kitted up in the back seat, along with my hunting rifle just in case I encountered some less than friendly animals when I was out there. The first sign that something was wrong up on this mountain came only a short distance from where I had parked my car. With my gear on my back and the rain not letting up, I almost didn't notice it at first, until I damn near kicked the thing. Half tucked into the bush, a set of black eyes looked back at me, unblinking and not moving. I froze up for a moment, but once my eyes actually focused on it, I saw that it couldn't bring me harm. It was the head of a deer that had spooked me. Just the head. When I actually moved to try to touch it with a gloved hand, it fell forward, revealing the stump of its mauled neck. On top of that, its horns had been completely removed in a similarly messy fashion. Whatever had killed it had done one hell of a job to say the least. The blood looked somewhat fresh too. Now normally, when I see something like that, I turn around pronto but I had only just made it out there and the idea of spending the weekend cooped up in my bachelor apartment was enough to outweigh the possibility of being mauled in that moment. Besides, I had my rifle with me and could easily just set up camp much further away from this little gore site. If something did give me trouble, I could just scare it off and hoof it back down the mountain before it could come back for a round two. Most of the logic was there at the time of me making that decision. Along the way, I hadn't seen anything really out of the ordinary. There are a large amount of deer prints in the fresh mud, with some possible elk as well, but that by itself couldn't be considered odd when one was this far away from civilization. 
It still bothered me, but I couldn't quite place my fingers as to why yet. Ultimately, I managed to find a good camping spot and spent the first night in my tent, watching the light drizzle of rain pour off the canvas and the eventual stars as the clouds parted ways. When morning came, I found another strange discovery. All around my campsite, imprinted in the soft ground, were hoof prints. It wasn't just a couple of them, but damn near hundreds scattered around where I slept. Some of the marks nearly appeared to be on top of each other. First an animal carcass, and now this. It wasn't like deer were known for being very aggressive though, so perhaps it was just some sort of weird timing. A herd might have been in the area, and what I had seen near my arrival was just one of the poor stragglers that had got picked off by something. The start to the morning still left me rather unsettled though, so I decided that I would spend the day hiking up the nearby ridge. A direction that coincided with the tracks funnily enough as I left the campsite, the tracks thinning as I went further and further along. Eventually, it was down to what looked like just an elk and deer that had once walked along there, with one set of tracks following strangely close to the other. As I followed the tracks, I noticed something new as well. Now, when I said I wasn't a hunter, I never meant to say that I didn't have a good eye for details out in the woods. Alongside these tracks were little specks of some kind of dark green liquid. It was on the ground, the occasional branch that had overlapped with the path, and leaves as well. Wherever it touched, it seemed to spread out and cause rot to the plant life. Really damn weird to see. I almost touched it, but thought better of it after seeing what it had done to those plants. My guess at the time was that one of the two that had left these marks had to have been really sick, and this was the leftovers of that. I felt bad for the things. With my rifle on my back though, I decided that I'd follow the tracks as long as they kept with my course, and if I came across the animal, I'd get a good idea of what kind of condition it was in through the scope. If it looked past gone, I'd put the thing out of its misery. Well, I got my wish, one way or another. After another couple hours of hiking, I still hadn't lost the trail. Whenever it petered out, I always seemed to find another sign of it that picked back up again. Then finally, I spotted the thing. I was heading down the hill when it lifted its head up to look around. It was probably a hundred feet or so in front of me in a clearing with tall grass. Now, from where I was, all I could really make out was its figure. It appeared to be a large elk, at least just from the size of the thing that had a coat of fur that was off collar. It looked almost like moss, it was so green. It also had a massive set of antlers that ended in razor tips that splayed out like branches. One thing I couldn't make out was its head, but that was because it faced away at the time. Kneeling down, I took my rifle off my shoulder and set myself up on a stump, letting the body rest on top of it as I peered down my scope and lined it up with the animal. It was when I got a close look at the thing that I realized just how wrong this animal was. Its fur wasn't just an off green, but it was coming off in patches, revealing dead grey mottled skin underneath. From these patches were the occasional gashes that leaked green ooze onto the grass below. Flies buzzed around the creature and crawled across its body as it moved lazily through the grass. The thing must have been in absolute agony. Seeing something in such a state made my decision easy and I switched my safety off, lining up for its head. I wanted to get a clean shot to make it as painless as possible, 
but couldn't until the thing was looking at me. Through the scope, I watched it finally emerge from the tall grass out into the clearing and nearly lost my lunch. It had eight legs. Four of them were normal, if not suffering from the oozing wounds, but the other four hung loosely between them with hooves that only made occasional contact with the ground. At that point, I didn't know what the hell this thing was suffering from, but I could barely stomach looking at it any longer, so I let out a sharp whistle to try to draw its gaze in my direction. The whistle broke through the forest calm and echoed off the mountain ridge. The elk's head turned, and my heart stopped. What looked back at me didn't even process at first. Like when you're looking at an image that just doesn't make sense, your mind can make out shapes because it's rejecting what it's actually looking at. A human skull looked out in my direction, bloody antlers adorning its forehead. It had no skin on it, nor eyes that I could see, only empty sockets that seemed to pierce my very soul. Its mouth. Oh god, its mouth. It had no jaw, and its extended tongue wobbled back and forth as its body swayed. I finally felt my heart start up again, and without even thinking, I pulled the trigger of my gun. With a crack, it fired, and I was sent sprawling back into the dirt. I didn't even look to see if I had hit. I just ran as fast as I could in the opposite direction. The wind was whistling in my ears. All sense of direction vanished as I simply moved my body as fast as I could. Only moments later though, I could hear it. The sound of thundering hooves close behind and getting closer. My eyes were so tunnel vision though, I failed to keep track of my feet and tripped on an exposed tree root, sending me head first down the hill where I finally came to a stop as I rolled hard into the base of a tree. My head was spinning, and my vision was blurred. My legs weren't responding either. All I could do was sit and wait for my vision to come back. I smelt it before I was able to see it. The stench of death and decay wafted its way towards me and assaulted my nostrils, bringing tears to my eyes as I clamped a hand across my mouth to avoid screaming. When my vision did return, I could see it again, only ten feet away now. The thing brought its head down as it approached me slowly. In those empty sockets, I saw something. Two pinpricks of light that seemed to regard me with dull consideration. Again, my body was locked, so all I could do was sit and stare as it got within three feet of me and raised its head up slightly. Now, I could see into its mouth. I could see as its tongue was pushed aside and fingers started to wriggle their way free from its throat. First the hand, then the wrist, then the elbow, until a full arm had extended itself out of the creature's mouth towards me. Its skin was as pale as snow, and its nails were blackened and cracked. Gingerly, it moved, one finger outstretched, until it made contact with my forehead. The last thing I can remember was feeling it dragging that nail across my forehead before the world went dark. I was found roughly a week later by search and rescue. Apparently, I had managed to wander back to my campsite, and well, I was catatonic and unresponsive at the time of rescue. I was not any worse than I remembered. I had a fractured leg and a nasty cut on my forehead, but was well fed and watered. My memory does not start for at least another week after my rescue. I don't know how I survived in those woods for that week. 
but I guess that should be the least of my worries at this point. You see, ever since that thing touched me and I regained my consciousness, I've been plagued with nightmares. Nightmares of butchering, of the wilderness, of a time where civilization has crumbled and all that is left is flesh and bone. That thing is calling to me. It's calling me back to those woods to finish what we had started. I've always had a knack for staying out of trouble. It's difficult to explain, but whether it be a feeling, a sense, a tingling, it's always been there for as long as I can remember. I wish I could say it always made sense, or that there was always a aha moment where I understood what just happened, or even that it was a little less terrifying when it happens, but that's rarely the case. I just know it always seems to work. I'd like to tell you about one of the less vague times it happened to me. Back in my early 20s, in the late 1990s, I decided I needed a change. I left my childhood home and moved in with my uncle on the other side of the state for a couple of months. Enough time to get a job, find an apartment and get myself situated for college. This was a big move for me. I'd spent a lot of time travelling, but had never lived more than 10 miles away from where I was born. It was both exciting and scary. Scales tipped more towards exciting. We lived in a backwoods town few people have heard of, even now, but close to a few major cities in Florida. When I told people where I lived, I just said between Gainesville and St. Augustine, rather than go through the you live where conversation. It's a rural area, not much more than red clay and a bunch of drying up lakes well past their prime. When giving people directions to the house, we actually told them, every turn you come to, just take one with a hard road. The first intersection without a hard road, turn right, two blocks past that on the left, it's the only house on that side. I don't think I ever learned the names of all those roads on the way home. I just aimed for the hard roads. The house was pretty secluded. I don't think there was much neighbourhood behind the house, just woods. The property sat on an intersection of clay roads with woods across the street to the front and one side of the house. The other side was an empty lot and then more woods. I remember it was a pretty big yard maybe a half acre or so, completely enclosed with a chain link fence. The house sat right in the middle of the property. If you walked to the front edge of the yard inside the fence, you could see the neighbor's driveway a little farther up the road on the other side. My uncle loved the place, not being able to see or hear anyone in any direction. I thought it was creepy as hell. It was a small house, two bedrooms, one bathroom. The living room had two exit doors, one to the front and one to the side. Each let out to a large porch. I know it's not a good thing, but I'm a smoker. Like a freight train kind of smoker. It's a family thing. An unhealthy curse handed down by each generation. It's like you weren't even considered an adult until you sat on grandma's porch and smoked with her. That's how you spent time with grandma. You sat on the porch, chain smoked, and talked about whatever needed talking about. I sure do miss that woman. I've never cared for smoking in the house, and my uncle was trying to quit, so we set up a little smoking table and a couple of chairs on his front porch. He was an early-to-rise, an early-to-bed kind of guy, and I was just the opposite. I didn't go to bed until 2 or 3 each morning, then slept in until 10 or 11. The hours you keep working at a restaurant, I guess. 
so I spent most of my evenings after work on the porch, usually reading a book or talking on the phone to friends back home. There wasn't much road traffic to speak of, even less after I came in from work. It was summer, and my cousin, my uncle's son from his first marriage, had come to spend a couple of weeks with his dad. We are a pretty tight-knit family, so the kid, aka little man, was more my little brother than my cousin. He was around four or five years old at the time. The house only had the two bedrooms, so we set up a pallet of blankets on the floor in the living room for him. I made a fort of it every night before he went to sleep, stretching the sheet between the couch and the coffee table over his head. There were big windows next to either of the doors going outside, and the blinds were old and kind of dog-chewed, so he liked to be covered up at night. I wasn't sure if it was so he couldn't see outside, or if he was worried something was outside seeing him. Either way, I could sympathize. On this particular night, I put him to bed and retired to the front porch. I called a friend of mine back home and proceeded to talk the night away. Kind of weird, the things we did before cell phones. We actually talked to people. I miss it sometimes. It was a typical warm southern night. Mid-80s temperature, not a breath of breeze and humid. Nights out there could really go either way. You either had a cacophony of frogs, crickets, catedids, and the occasional alligator. Or worse, you couldn't hear yourself think over the silence. The chorus of nightlife was going strong that evening, which is actually pretty cool. If you've never heard it, each type of insect and critter sings together, matching the rest in volume and cadence. And then one crescendos, briefly shutting out the others before going back down to rejoin the others. Every so often, you'll hear a couple of competing solos, or duets, louder and louder until one wears out. It's almost background stuff, and you usually tune it out, but it's neat to stop and listen. Until it just stops. And that's how it started. I'm talking on the phone, mostly listening, honestly. The critters are singing in the background, and I remember feeling just the briefest chill. Not enough to really notice at first. But then, everything went quiet. It didn't fade or lower in volume. It stopped. The chill settled in. She was still talking. I could hear her voice in my ear. But I wasn't listening anymore. I was staring into the wooded lot across the street. There wasn't anything to see over there, but I couldn't look away. I don't know if it was my uncle, a previous owner, or maybe the country, but there was a sodium vapor streetlight in front of the house, just outside of the chain link fence, a little to my right as I stared out there. It gave a decent amount of light to the front of the house, and was really nice when you were bringing groceries in from your car after dark. But this night really underscored my issue with the light. The bulb itself was mounted directly to the pole, rather than extending away from it. An extension of some kind would have provided more light in every direction, I think. The way the bulb housing hugged the pole itself, though, hard shadows ran behind the pole across the street. Complete darkness spreading in roughly a 90 degree arc behind the light pole. I guess it's the juxtaposition of the light versus the dark in that part of the yard. But the space behind the pole was the darkest part of the night. And that's where I was looking. I tried to shake it off. Admittedly, I can get creeped out pretty easily. I've seen a lot of weird stuff and I know I can scare myself without much help. So, I tried to just ignore it and get back into the conversation. I opened my mouth to say something, to chime into whatever we were talking about with something witty, I'm sure. Be 
quiet. It's not really a voice, but it sometimes comes across as one. I knew there was no one actually talking to me, just my brain reacting to and dealing with something. So, I'm well aware it's my own head when I hear a voice like that, just to be clear. But when I do hear it, I listen. This is that thing I mentioned when I started, what always keeps me out of trouble. It wasn't the first time I heard it. I could hear my friend going on and on through the phone at my ear, but it was distant. I could also hear something across the street. That was the summer of 1998, and it was a North Florida summer marked by drought and fires. The underbrush was dry and crisp. Something over there had just taken a step through it. I didn't really know what to do. I could feel my heart beating in my temples. It felt like something was looking at me, through me. It was uncomfortable and more than a little invasive feeling. I didn't like it. I wanted to go inside. Don't move. Okay, we aren't moving. Check. Done. She was telling me about a new restaurant back home. How she and a few of her other friends had been and liked it a lot. We needed to go when I could visit again. And she stopped by to see my mom. And the other day had a great time at the house. It can hear her. It tried to it cracked under its weight. I couldn't just hang up on her. If I did, she was going to call back. It struck me as a very bad thing to have the phone ring while I was out here. My hand was shaking, holding the phone to my head. Wendy, I have to go, I whispered to her. She went to say something else, but I cut her off. That thing just happened right now. I have to go. Something is out here. I'll call you later. Be careful, she said, and hung up. She and I were close friends, had been for years, and she knew what I meant. I clicked the phone off and put it on the table. It was one of those big, curved, cordless models with a stubby little antenna. I remember them being very popular back then. Worried she would call back, or I'd be killed because of some weird wrong number calling at 2 o'clock in the morning, I flipped the ringer to off. Another step from across the street, and then another. It was walking faster now. It was definitely closer than when I first heard it. I braced myself, ready to jump up from the chair and run into the house. Don't. It's watching. So, I didn't. I listened. I can't even explain how much I wanted to just up and run right then. There was an exhalation. I don't really know how to explain it. Not a snort or a grunt, but a hard exhalation. And then a scrape. Another step. Get inside. I damn near turned the table over as I jumped up from the chair and ran for the door. It was only a few steps, but it seemed like I'd never make it. And it really didn't help that I could hear the thing across the street break into a run. Twigs and branches, snapping and crunching. Something broke over there, I guess, as it ran through a brush or a low-hanging branch. Now, it was outside of the woods. There was a thumping as its feet hit the hard-baked clay road. Right as I made it inside the door and got it shut behind me, I heard the clang of the chain-link fence as something hit its top rail, surely vaulting over top and into our yard. Lock the door. I barely turned the deadlock in the door when the voice came again. Turn off the light. The single light in the living room was from a weirdly elaborate light fixture attached to the ceiling fan. I called it the Venus flytrap, with the strange flowery stained glass petals surrounding the bulbs which always tinted the light to a pale green. I grabbed the pull cord 
and kill the light. Slam. Something hit the door from outside. It sounded like whatever had been running at me just headbutted the door. That was the picture in my head at least. I don't know how I didn't make a noise. It scared me so bad. The blind shook in the window beside the door, a dry rustling sound as they wrote the wood in the frame. Hide. I thought about going to my room, which was the furthest point in the house from that door, but my cousin was sound asleep on the living room floor. I wasn't about to leave him out there by himself, but waking him up seemed like just as bad an idea. Another angry pounding against the door. The blind shook again. I wondered how securely fastened they were to the top of the frame. What if they fell off the window and I ended up face to face with some thing outside staring at me? All I could think was that if that happened, the streetlight would be to its back, lighting up the house, and I wouldn't be able to see it with a light in my eyes. I don't know why I even thought about that, but it scared the hell out of me. I got down on the floor and climbed into the fort we'd made earlier, between the couch and the coffee table. It seemed as good a spot as any. Little man stirred a bit as I settled next to him, but he didn't wake up. More banging on the porch. Sounded like the table was being dragged, pulled across the wood floor out there. Another bang. And under all that, the best word to describe it. Breathing. It was somewhere between a snort or a growl, something out of breath. A quick snarl punctuated by more banging furniture. It slammed against the door again, growled. To say I was scared is a monstrous understatement. I didn't know what the hell to do. What if it stopped hitting the door and started hitting the window? The voice in my head was quiet though. As much as I could, I just trusted it would be saying something if there was anything I should be doing, and laughed at myself for waiting on the voices in my head to tell me what to do. I probably didn't laugh right at that exact moment, but you get the idea. It jumped off the porch. I don't really know how to explain that sound, except that you could hear and feel its weight on the wood planks out there. And then, it was not there. Straining my ears to hear something, anything, all I could think was that it was gone. It was going to leave us alone. Slam. This one from the door to the side of the living room. I didn't hear it over there before it hit the door. I think I might have yelped or something when it hit. Little man shook a bit, but he was still sleeping. A couple more scrapes and bangs outside and now it was panting. Again, I'm wondering about that window. It felt like luck that it didn't hit the one on the front porch. Too much to hope for that it wouldn't find the one on the side porch. But it didn't. Maybe a minute or two later, or really, my perception of time was so screwed up it could have been half a minute or a half hour. It was gone. I heard it jump down again. Its breathing faded. I braced myself for another bang, but all was quiet. I don't know how long I lay there, hugging little man to me, not really sure who was comforting who for that next little while. I eventually fell asleep, waking up to the smell of breakfast and coffee. The previous night came back to me pretty quickly. I was happy to see everyone up and around. Both my uncle and little man were up, and around already, and I felt more than just a little silly climbing out from under the blanket fort built in the living room. My uncle just grinned at me, said he'd slept in the living room with a little guy a few times himself. I went for the door, really needing that first smoke of the morning. Felt like I'd earned it. Little man stopped me on the way out, surprised me, just came up and hugged me. I had to kneel down to catch him, so he wasn't hugging my knees. It was a good hug, deep and heartfelt. 
he pulled away from me, looked at me like I don't think a kid has ever looked at me. I'm really glad you're okay, he said. I had a bad dream that you were outside and got eaten by the monster across the street. I think all my blood froze right then. I don't know if I wanted to laugh or cry. I told him I was just fine. No monsters for me. They don't think I taste good. He laughed and was done with it. He was back in the kitchen helping his dad with breakfast. And I really needed to smoke. It was my last scare of the morning. But it was a good one. Not really sure what I was expecting. But the yard around the house looked like a war zone. My smoking table was in pieces. Parts of it in the front of the house. Other parts on the side of the house. And one of the legs was out in the road. One of the chairs was near disintegrated. We never found the other one. We get a big metal bucket full of sand on the side of the front porch. The butt bucket. It was on its side in the far back corner of the yard. It weirded me out that the sand and collection of butts previously inside the bucket were nowhere near the house or the bucket but in the far corner of the yard. No matter how many times I've thought this through, that part never really made much sense. How did that thing get the bucket to the backyard? Why were the contents dumped in the front yard? What the hell was it that it could have carried the bucket to the front to dump it? My uncle saw me checking out the front yard, came out to the front door to join me. I remember he whistled when he came out, surprised to see the yard. It's funny now, and I think I nervous laughed then. He asked if I was throwing parties after he went to bed every night. He cocked an eyebrow at me and rubbed at a fresh dent in the front door. Not quite. I wasn't sure what to do still, so I told him everything that happened the night before. To be honest, I really thought he was going to laugh at me, make fun of me for my overactive imagination, and I was never going to hear the end of it. He didn't. Instead, he told me he'd had a couple of weird things happen to him out there, said it really bothered him coming home after dark that he hated not being able to see across the street because of that street light, and that he'd seen things on the edge of the fence, but mostly across the street. We went back inside, and he showed me where he kept two of his rifles and one of his handguns. Well, out of sight, but easy to reach in a hurry. We went back out and cleaned the mess left in the yard. He said that with a national forest on just about all sides of us, there were a lot of animals we weren't used to out there. There were plenty of bobcats, coyotes, panthers, even bears, and God only knew what else. I agreed, taking some comfort in that. My overactive imagination paired with a real-life animal. Yeah, that was going to be scary. And I really wished he'd stopped there. I think it's something else, though. He said, whatever it is out here, feels smarter than that. I think it knows us. I don't think I'll ever forget him saying that. I tried to get him to say more, but he wouldn't, and he wouldn't ever speak about it again. I was only there another couple of weeks, thankfully uneventful weeks. When I left, I never went back to that house. Something about it after that night just didn't feel right. I wish I had more to tell you, or a better explanation for what happened that night. Last spring, I sought solitude in the middle of the Olympic National Forest in Washington. I suffer from depression. I was going through a real rough bout. One where I no longer knew my purpose in the world or cared that I even existed. I know that sounds dark and I should have sought professional help. 
but I'm one of those people who tend to run away from problems, hoping they'll work themselves out. I'm not sure if the goal was to break myself out of my depression or to isolate myself even further. Either way, I found myself driving through the tall, mossy pines into the tangled depths of the whole rainforest for a long solo backpacking excursion. My journey began at the Ho River trailhead and would take me through the thick woods and then a clearing where I would eventually see Mount Olympus in all its glory. After that, well, I hadn't exactly planned where I would go after that. I would just keep walking, I guess. Unlike my other treks, which were thoroughly planned out, I didn't have a set itinerary. It was as if I wanted to get lost. Yes, that's it, I thought to myself, as I strapped my green Delta pack around my waist. I want to get lost. Maybe then I would feel something again, and my survival instinct would kick in. Or maybe I would cease to exist altogether. I would just walk until I couldn't go any further. I told no one where I was going. Throughout the first few miles of my hike, I felt as if I wasn't truly a part of my surroundings. It was as if I were just an observer as people and wildlife moved about me. The hanging moss draping over the three branches like green sleeves, the rushing of the whole river, all seemed so distant, even though I was immersed in it all. The only feeling I remember having was the cold touch of rain as it sprinkled on my face like frozen tears. Time seemed to melt away, and before long, I found myself at the edge of the forest. Before I emerged into the clearing, a strange fork in the trail caught my eye. Now, a fork in the trail isn't strange in and of itself, but this one didn't belong here. It wasn't on my topography map. It wasn't listed in the national park. It was out of place. Unlike the trail I was on, this one seemed to snake deeper into the forest. I had hiked this part of the trail many times. Never once did I notice a fork. Maybe it's new, I thought. Maybe they didn't update the maps yet. My original plan was to continue straight, as I always did. But something about the other trail beckoned me to wander to unknown territory. At closer look, the trail looked well maintained, so it wasn't likely I would stray off path. I could always turn around. It was at that moment that I felt an emotion rather than emptiness, if you could even call that an emotion. It was excitement. I found myself walking down the new trail my adventurous spirit back in commission. At first, the trail just seemed like another part of the whole rainforest, but after a couple miles, the forest began to change. I know that seems crazy, but the forest looked brighter. The Sitka spruce and western hemlock gave way to a variety of birch, oak, and a few pine trees in between. A clear stream trickled alongside my path, a stream, like the trail, not on my map. Even though it wasn't yet the season for wildflowers, a carpet of reds, purples and yellow covered the forest floor in between the trees. I couldn't identify them, but they were beautiful and brought life to the forest. I felt as if I were in a whole other part of the world. I no longer saw any other people. The trail I started on was packed as usual, but I didn't see anyone else on this trail, which surprised me. After a while, I started to feel almost high. I felt as if my body and mind were apart from each other, that I was floating rather than walking. I also noticed that the lights were dim and bright in waves as if someone was slowly turning a dimmer switch back and forth from bright to almost completely dark. Light, dark, light, dark. 
as if in a steady rhythm. At first, I thought it was the clouds. But a cloud doesn't turn the world completely dark. When the forest darkened, the day seemed to turn to night. When it would brighten again, it looked as if it were midday. The strangest part of all this was that I didn't find any of this strange. Nor did I find it strange that when the forest shifted from light to dark, I would feel myself shift places. When it turned dark, I would no longer be in the trail, but along the forest floor, crawling on all fours, underneath the flowers and ferns. When the forest lightened, I would be back on the trail, hiking like I had been. This happened several times, each shift to the dark, bringing me closer and closer to where I was on the trail. A few more shifts from light to dark, and I started to feel a predatory instinct to hunt, to kill. When it shifted back to light, back to the trail, I began to feel uneasy, as if I was being watched, hunted. Yet, for some reason, I still felt a tranquil high, and I didn't feel the need to run. Shift. Darkness again. I was getting closer to the trail. I saw a figure walking down the trail, wearing a blue raincoat and carrying a green pack like my own. They ambled along the trail, seemingly oblivious to my presence. I crept closer, trying not to make a sound. They looked weak, easy prey. They would never see it coming. I became ravenous for their body. I wanted nothing more than to tear them to shreds. I lunged for them, but they turned around, arms outstretched, ready to fight me off, as if they could do anything to stop me. The brown eyes met my own. Shift. Back to light. I found myself thrown to the ground, the wind knocked out, and a huge gash on my arm. What the hell just happened, I thought. Something attacked me. I didn't get a good look at it, but the eyes looked so familiar, as if I were looking into a mirror. Realisation washed over me. Did I attack myself? How is this possible? I slowly lowered my hands and looked around, scanning the bushes for any sign of movement. Nothing. No sound, and nothing in sight. But I couldn't help but feel I was being watched. My eye was gone. All I felt was dread. I gazed around the unfamiliar landscape. This was not Olympic National Forest. I knew that for a fact. This landscape did not belong in Washington whatsoever. The forest darkened once more, and I could feel whatever darkness that was following me start to close in once again. This time, I did not shift places. I'm still being hunted, I thought. I knew I had to get out of there, but I had no idea which way I came from, or if I would wind up back where I started. Was this some other dimension? A vortex? If so, would retracing my steps even work? It didn't matter. I realised if I waited much longer, whatever attacked me would strike again. I had to move. As I sprinted along the path, the forest began to change. In fact, the whole world began to change. The sky darkened to grey. The trees lost their vibrant leaves, and every branch and bush seemed to turn into sharp, reaching fingers, trying to snatch me in their grasp. A gale force wind began to whip through my ears and slash my face. I heard a foul voice calling for me in the air, though I could only make out a few sentences. They belong to us. Don't let them get away. Why are you running? And finally, I thought you wanted to get lost. I almost stopped cold right then and there. 
I had wanted to get lost. I told myself that. In my head, anyway. Whatever was pursuing me knew my thoughts and was preying on my weakness. As if in response, the wind howled once more and the voice followed. That's right, it said. You want to disappear. You want death. The whisper turned into a deep demonic growl as it added, And we will give it to you. I pushed my legs harder and caught my foot on a tree root, collapsing completely to the ground, eating dirt. I wanted to give up at that point. Just let it take me. There was no use. As I struggled to my knees, I could feel the tangled brush wind its way around my legs and torso, working its way up to my neck as if to strangle me, to consume me. I almost let it happen. Whether by a sudden will to live or refusal to die this way, I stood up and charged forward once again, ripping through the branches which cut through my clothes and skin like thorns. Once I broke free, I saw the familiar mossy green trees and overcast sky of the Olympic National Forest of Washington. The voices angrily yelled my name, demanding me to stop, threatening a worse demise if I leave. I did my best to ignore them all. I jumped forward at the end of the fork, under the soggy grass. I whipped around, expecting my pursuers to be right behind me. They weren't. The trail disappeared, as if it had never existed at all. Did I imagine that, I thought. I looked down to examine my clothes, still intact. The gash in my arm was gone. There were no cuts or scrapes where the branches twisted around me. However, I still felt the stinging pain as if my wounds were still there. The voices echoed, but this time only in my head. I hoped it was an imagination. The voice kept saying, Next time. Needless to say, I cut my trip short. I decided, at the very least, to take steps to cure my depression. I'm going to therapy. I quit drinking. I'm even working out and eating right. Anything to get me in a better mindset. However, I can't shake this feeling that I'm no longer alone. That something is always watching. Always listening for my next moment of weakness. Listening for the next time I desire to disappear. I have worked as a paranormal investigator for close to 30 years. I always believed that there was more to our world than what most think. Like the submerged section of an iceberg, there is something under our choppy waters of regular existence. I suppose there is little other reason to take this job other than that belief. It certainly isn't for the money or respect. But I would be lying if I said my early years in this profession didn't test my faith in the existence of the paranormal world. For the first four years of my work, I found nothing. No evidence of a single paranormal phenomenon in any of the cases I took. There were hordes of unconfirmable ghost sightings, hauntings that were explained away by natural phenomenon, and even the odd prankster or two. I felt like I was floundering. I started to wonder if I had followed a road that led nowhere. My destination nothing but a hazy mirage perpetually on the horizon. That was, until I took a case in 1997. My most haunting case, still to this day. The case of the Grinning Man. Do you mind if I record this interview? I asked. No, that's okay, Audrey said. We were in the living room of a small home. Audrey sat on the sofa across from me, a 35-year-old woman that looked closer to 50. She was small, 
hunched over, as if a weight pressed on her shoulders. I placed the tape recorder on the coffee table and pressed the record button. Inside, the cassette tape whirred to life. Audrey, thank you for calling me to investigate your problem. I want you to know I'll take your claims seriously and investigate them as such. Whatever the outcome may be, if the phenomenon you're experiencing is paranormal or natural, I'll seek to find the truth the best I can. Thank you. Please, start from the beginning. She sighed and brushed some stray, frazzled hair behind her ear with one hand. I could see she was at a wit's end. Her face bore deep wrinkles beyond her age. Her eyes contained within dark purple sockets and her nails chewed away to ragged edges. Whatever she was experiencing, paranormal or not, was certainly real to her. Okay, she began. I guess it all started when I was a baby. That far back? Yes, my first memories are of seeing him. Him? What I call the grinning man. She shuddered when she said it. The thing that's been haunting me my entire life. I can even remember him as a baby. It's burned into my memories. He dresses like someone from the 40s or 50s with a tan trench coat and black fedora. I was laying in my crib when I first recalled seeing him. He gripped the crib's bars while he peered down at me through them, looming over a little, helpless me like an ominous mountain. Just thinking of it turns my stomach. And was he grinning at you? Yes, like he always is. Have you ever heard people describe a psychopath's grin, where their smile is there and looks friendly enough, but if you look closely, you can see their eyes hold nothing. I think I understand. His smile is like that. It's like he has reptilian eyes, unfeeling, cold, predatory, evil. Must have had quite an impact on you, considering you remember it from that far back. Has he been cropping up your entire life? Yes, it's sporadic. Sometimes I go years without seeing him. Other times, I'll see him multiple times a month. And... And what's a typical encounter like? Well, he'll appear out of nowhere. Then he stands as still as a statue and watches me with that sick grin of his plastered across his face. He could show up anywhere, at any time. Among the trees as I walk through the park, from a random house's window as I walk down the street. The shadows of my own home when I get a glass of water in the middle of the night. Does this entity ever say or do anything? No, always silent, always unmoving, just tracking me with his eyes. Interesting. Do you ever feel anything when you see this entity? Yes, an intense sense of dread and a tightness in the chest, almost like he's reaching out with imaginary, brooding fingers to squeeze my heart. And sometimes, when I see him, something terrible happens soon after. You mean that a sighting of the Grinning Man is a precursor to a traumatic event? Yes, not all the time, but enough that when I see him, my nerves will be shot, and I'll walk around with this dark cloud weighing on me as I wait for the worst to happen. Could you give me an example? Audrey sighed, and tears welled at the corner of her eyes. She averted a gaze and looked out the window. If it's too difficult, you don't have to- No, it's okay. She reached for the tissue box on the coffee table, took a couple, sniffled, and dabbed her eyes. The worst incident was in 1993, I had been married for three years and had just given birth to our first child. He was four months old at the time. I was back at work by then, and I was coming home very late one evening. The roads were dead, a bad storm had just passed through, and I still remember the long, 
colorful glows of the traffic lights and street lamps across the wet roads. I came to a stop at a red. I just happened to glance to my right. It was there, half covered in shadows. He stood on the pavement by the crosswalk, the walk signal glowing green as if he meant to cross it. That grin had sunk my heart as if it had turned into stone. I don't know exactly how long I stayed there, locked in his gaze, but when my light turned green again, I got out of there as fast as I could. When I looked in the rear view, I saw his silhouette in the street, watching me as I fled. I knew I'd struggled to sleep that night. I was shaking and felt like throwing up. I had to take a Valium, and that helped. I popped into bed and passed out more than fell asleep. I was awoken by my husband frantically shaking me in the morning. His face was pale, a look of sheer, terror-filled panic I had never seen before. Our son had passed away in the night. The death was ruled as a sit case. I sat in silence, giving Audrey a moment as she let her emotions out. At the time, I wasn't sure what to think. Her story was unique, far from the standard ghostly apparitions others saw. I was intrigued. I did wonder if it was a mental condition. I had encountered a schizophrenic who would believe that hallucinations were a result of paranormal phenomena on a previous case, though their condition had been more apparent even to me. If Audrey was ill, it was not obvious. Audrey, have you seen any medical professionals? It is possible that your sightings could be hallucinations. Yes, I have. I had kept the grinning man a secret my entire life. After all, who would believe me? I even kept it from my husband. But after our son had died, I had to tell him. I don't know why, but I just did. He was obviously concerned for me, my mental health. He wanted me to see a therapist. I refused at first. We had a lot of fights about it, and eventually he forced me to go see someone. What did they say? Well, I was put through the ringer. Eventually, I was diagnosed with psychosis. I was put on meds went to therapy twice a week, and none of it helped. He would still show up. Eventually, I quit the meds, quit the therapy. Waste of time and money, as far as I was concerned. But my husband thought different. He didn't like that I quit all of it, and our marriage kind of fell apart from there. But I was, still am, convinced what I was experiencing is real that's why I came to you. I figured someone like you would at least take my story seriously. I nodded. I do. And there's another reason I sought you out. Please. Well, I need help. I've been seeing the Grinning Man a lot more lately. He's been appearing more frequently than ever before. How often? Every few nights for the past two or three months. He only shows up at night now, usually outside my bedroom window, and I did see him in the hallway last week. I never used to sleep with my bedroom door closed, but now I do. I don't know if I can take it much longer. My nerves are shot. Dread suffocates my chest all the time. I think something terrible is going to happen soon. I'm scared of what he might do to me. But you can prove it, right? You can prove he's real. You can help me get rid of it, right? I'll try, Audrey. I'll try. After the interview, I tested a home for electromagnetic fields. Strong EMFs can often be responsible for hallucinations of apparitions or that creepy feeling that elicits goosebumps on the back of your neck. It often causes people to believe 
they're experiencing a haunting. In reality, it's usually just poor electrical wiring or old and dirty wall sockets bleeding electricity into the environment. Those EMFs can mess with people's senses. Though Audrey's sightings of the Grinning Man are not tied to a particular location, I figured EMFs may be responsible for her lasting string of sightings that occurred primarily in a bedroom. But after a sweep of the house, I detected nothing abnormal. I then set up a camera on a tripod in a bedroom. It sat beside the head of the bed and had a complete shot of a room, including the window on the opposite wall and the door on the right that led into the hallway. Both places she had seen the grinning man previously. I showed her how to record and instructed her to do so when she went to bed. I also gave her a nightlight to plug into an outlet so the camera could see. Night vision and thermal imaging cameras were well out of my budget back then. I swung by a house the next two mornings to collect and review the tapes. Those nights were uneventful. On the third night, I got a frenzied call from Audrey. The ringing jarred me awake. The clock on my nightstand read 2.08am. I trudged to the phone, and as soon as I answered, Audrey's frantic voice came over the line. He was here. He tried to hurt me. I arrived at Audrey's a little over half an hour later. She paced back and forth in the living room, a neglected cigarette burning in her hand, the ash tip grown long and pale as bone. She muttered one thing over and over. No escape, no escape, no escape. It took a minute to calm her down. At first, she looked right through me, as if I weren't there. Her eyes distant and fear-stricken, as she continued to mutter, can't escape, until the words burned into my ears. I eventually ushered her into the kitchen and sat her down. I found some cocoa in the cupboards and made her a warm cup. It seemed to help a little. Her trembling stopped. I'm going to watch the tape, I said. Do you want to watch it with me? She shook her head adamantly. She waited in the kitchen while I watched. She had a VCR player hooked up to a CRT television in her living room. I sat on the edge of the coffee table, rather than the sofa, for a closer view. I inserted the tape, and the TV came to life with a view of Audrey's home bathed in dim orange from the nightlight, and the window at the far end shined with a pale glow from the moon. The footage wasn't great, being comparatively rudimentary for what we have today. The picture quality was grainy, and sometimes wavered in the way those VCR tapes did, but it was enough to see what I needed to. I fast forwarded the tape until the text on the bottom right corner read 1.30 a.m. I sat with a pen and notepad in hand, and I still have my notes from what I saw on the tape. 1.30 a.m. Audrey asleep in bed, nothing untoward. 1.35 a.m. Audrey becomes visibly restless, flipping and turning violently in her sleep. 1.38 a.m. Audrey settled. 1.40 a.m. Dark figure crossed the window on opposite wall. 1.42 a.m. Dark figure crossed window again in opposite direction. 1.44 a.m. Dark figure standing in front of window. Figure looks like a person, possibly wearing a hat. Figure too dark to make out features. 1.46 a.m. Static, intermittently breaking up picture. Figure still standing at window. 1.50 a.m. The figure disappeared. Did not walk or move away. Simply vanished. 1.51 a.m. Audrey becoming restless again. 1.52 a.m. Bedroom door opened. That was the last note I took. 
My heart was pounding in my ears by this point. A few seconds after, the door had opened, seemingly by itself. The man appeared from the darkness in the hallway, like a demon emerging from the depths of hell. I dropped my notepad and gawked at the television screen. Even through the grainy footage and the worsening bursts of static, I could make out the grin plastered across the figure's face. The grinning man. The nightlight suddenly went out and the screen went black. It took a few moments for the lens to adjust to the dimmer moonlight coming through the window. And when it did, the grinning man was a dark silhouette just inside the doorway. I stood and approached the television, bent over at the waist, face inches from the screen to get a closer look. The tape wavered badly, making everything unrecognizable. When the picture cleared, the grinning man had teleported from the doorway to the bedside, just in front of the camera. He peered down at Audrey. My heartbeat thumped steadily in my ears. The picture wavered again, for longer. When it steadied, the grinning man had his arms extended downward towards Audrey. She was now kicking and thrashing in bed. The grinning man's hands appeared to be clasped around her throat. The blanket was flung from the bed suddenly, a big dark cloud moving across the screen. Audrey thrashed and the grinning man held on. The moonlight glanced off his teeth, making the diabolic grin a glimmering silver blemish at the base of his darkened face. Like his grin, his eyes shined palely with manic glee. A prolonged burst of static. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. The picture came back. The nightlight was on, and Audrey sat upright in bed, grasping at her neck. The grinning man was gone. I felt something in the air then, like heavy humidity. A powerful feeling that pervaded the house. A feeling of anger. The VCR tape paused by itself, then began to rewind. The tape whined frantically inside the player with a high pitch. The picture on the screen sheared, then went black. Smoke seeped from the vents of the player and around the edges of the opening flap. I mashed the eject button, hoping to save the tape. But the crinkling noise, that sounded like crumbling cellophane, left me with little confidence. The flap turned back, and the tape flew out, as if shot from a cannon. The mess of cracked casing and wadded tangled tape hit me in the chest and fell to the floor. The television flew off the cabinet suddenly, pushed from an unseen force, and landed before my feet with the screen shattering. Audrey came in from the kitchen, alarmed. She glanced at the TV, laying busted on the floor. Then the tape next to me, and then at me. What happened? He's real, I said, breathlessly. I saw it on the tape. He's real. Perhaps it was foolish to simply believe leaving the home would have helped, but it was the only thing I could think to do. I took Audrey to a nearby hotel and booked us into neighboring rooms. I sat on the edge of my bed at a loss. I had completely underestimated what we were dealing with. Until watching that tape, I wasn't even sure the entity was real. But not only was it real, it was dangerous. I phoned a close acquaintance, one that wasn't so happy to be woken at three in the morning, who worked for another paranormal investigation team. He was happy to help once I explained the seriousness of the situation. He gave me the number of a good medium who could help give me a reading, perhaps to identify what we were dealing with. I was also hoping she might have known methods to banish the entity from Orge's life, if it were at all possible. I decided to call the medium first thing in the morning. 
but it would be too late for her to do anything by then. I lay down on the bed, my thoughts swimming in a fuzzy haze of fatigue and the calm down of an adrenaline spike. I realized that, for the first time, with true conviction, I had encountered something under the surface of the normal world. Something sinister hiding in those deep and dark, murky waters below. You can live your life pretending that world is not real. Many do. And sure, chances are, you'll never be affected by it. But you should know, that world is real. And it's there, lurking in the darkest shadows around us. With some difficulty, I eventually fell asleep. The short doze from three to dawn was restless. I had a nightmare I was drowning in black sludge, as dark as the starless night sky above me. My arms and legs struggled through thick and oily liquid as I fought to keep my head above the surface. My breath got short and my chest squeezed tight. Panic flooded in through every pore of my body as the presence of an evil prickled my skin. And then, darkness. I awoke to sunlight glowing around the edges of the grimy motel curtain. The bedsheets were a scrunched up mess and my blanket lay strewn over the floor. With a sick feeling creeping up my gut, I realized how this scene closely mirrored what I saw in the aftermath of the attack on Audrey. I rushed out of my room to Audrey's next door. She didn't answer the first few knocks, so I knocked louder. No answer. I called her name and pounded on the door. Still, no answer. I rushed to the motel's front desk, convincing them to let me into the room. When we entered, Audrey was in her bed. Her pale face poked out from the blanket. Her lips were blue, her eyes vacant and lifeless, stared at nothing. My heart plummeted. She was dead. I dream of that morning often, the moment we walked into that godforsaken room to see Audrey drained of life. I'll never forget that. The case has stuck with me all these years. I pored over the details many times. I relive my actions and question if there was more I could have done. I try not to blame myself. I know it's not healthy. But I just can't lift the weight of guilt that still sits on my shoulders. Or perhaps it's my liver that takes the brunt. Fact is, as I see it, she came to me for help. And I did not do enough. I wish I could tell you I got revenge on this thing, that I tracked the entity down and vanquished it like a hero at the end of a Hollywood action movie. But life doesn't tend to work like that. Besides my experience with Audrey and that close brush I had that night in the dingy motel room, I've yet to cross the path of the grinning man ever again. But that's the nature of this line of work. Things don't get wrapped up and topped off with a neatly tied bow. We deal with things that are on the edge. Things that straddle the line between the world we know and the one we don't. Things are hazy, transient, and often unknowable. Neat resolutions don't find their way to us easily. I can tell you that Audrey's death was eventually ruled as a case of sudden arithmetic death syndrome, or SADS. As you can probably guess, I have some doubts that that was all there was to it. I still call the medium. We met a couple of weeks after Audrey's passing. We went to the motel and booked the same room Audrey had died in. The work of the desk was certainly curious as to why I insisted on that room, but I refused to say. The medium's face drained of colour the second she stepped inside. She walked around the room in silence for ten minutes. She moved slowly, intently, closing her eyes 
and breathing deep as she tapped into a strange, ominous world. Can't say I envy her talents. Something incredibly powerful, she eventually said. It's not here now, but I can still feel its vestiges. How long ago did this happen? A little over two weeks. A grave expression crossed the medium's face. Yes, very powerful. Do you know what the entity is? Not precisely, but I can say that its soul is black and twisted. That thing has a soul? All intelligent forces do. And what do you mean by black and twisted? I mean the entity is a corrupted agent of death itself. I was speechless for a moment as the weight of her words robbed me of breath. A drip coming from the sink in the bathroom was the only thing to break the crushing silence. What can we do about it? I asked. The medium smiled wistfully, at my naivete I assume. I was young and inexperienced and ready for a fight. She knew that. Then her expression grew dark as she took one last look over the room. Not a thing, she said. I took a trip to Spain this summer. My girlfriend, Robin, and I started in Granada in the south. We stayed in a charming little bed and breakfast just off an ancient cobblestone path leading up to the Grand Red Palace known as Alhambra. We walked around the city, ordered drinks at bars, just to get delicious tapas, and most thrillingly, got engaged in the beautiful gardens of the Alhambra. It was the best vacation of my life. Until we went to Barcelona. That's not to say Barcelona isn't a beautiful, welcoming city, because it absolutely is. We stayed in a hotel outside a shampoo. We ate more tapas and celebrated our new engagement. On the second to last day of our trip, however, we decided to pull ourselves away from Hamon long enough to visit something we had always wanted to see. The Basilica de la Sagrada Familia. If you've never heard of Sagrada Familia, Google it right now. It's simply one of the most stunningly beautiful buildings in the world. It's a church that famous Catalan architect Antoni Gaudi began constructing in 1852, and it looks like a structure from Tim Burton's Halloween Town was airdropped into a modern city. Gaudi never actually got around to finishing it. It's technically not finished even now, with the local government promising to wrap things up in 2026, the 100th anniversary of Gaudi's death. Neither Robin nor I are particularly religious. She's a lapsed Catholic, and I'm a lapsed nothing. But you don't need to be in touch with the Holy Spirit to marvel at the artistic and architectural brilliance that is the Sagrada Familia. We arrived midday on a Thursday to a much larger crowd than we anticipated. We had purchased tickets beforehand, but still needed to navigate a long security line. Once we made it through and onto the promenade of the building itself, I could only stare up in awe. Up close, you would swear that the thing was built by the angels themselves. The Sagrada Familia offers self-guided tours in which you visit a kiosk, select your language, and receive a bulky cell phone-like device that you can place against your ear and listen to facts about the Basilia as you walk along. We selected English, grabbed our phones, and advanced to a sign near the entrance that had a one on it. We picked up our audio devices and pressed the play button. Sure enough, the little display on the front read, One, welcome. I brought the phone up to my ear and began listening to a British woman's soothing voice emanate from the receiver. Number one, welcome. Welcome to the Basilia della Sagrada Familia. 
In this section, you can see a map of the Basilia. Take your time to examine the floor plan and imagine what the cathedral inside may look like. As you advance, explore the Basilia. You will see numbered signs alerting you to listen and learn more about the pride of Barcelona. I smiled at my fiancé as she pulled a device away from her ear. We took some time to examine the map in front of us and the massive pearly facade behind us. After a brief search for the second sign, we found it closer to the church's entrance. We counted the three and hit our play buttons at the same time, holding them back up to our ears. Number two, the Basilia's origins. Architect Francisco del Pola del Villar began construction on the Sangrada family in 1882, but left the project just a year later due to disagreements with the direction of the Basilia. Antoni Gaudi then took over, recognizing the unique opportunity to keep evil in bondage. Gaudi knew that ancient Iberian texts uncovered in the 19th century revealed that the entity known as the Dread, or the No Thing, was buried under enchanted soil in the Catalan lands north of the Mediterranean. I pulled the device away from my ear again and looked at Robin to see if her face was showing the same signs of confusion mine surely was. But the little black box remained at her right ear, and she was looking up serenely at the cathedral's many spires. Hesitantly, I began to listen again. In fact, it is theorized that the turmoil in Spain following Napoleon Bonaparte's brief occupation may have been due to the influence of the dread gathering strength from within the Earth's mantle. The primitive spells from Iberian tribes could only keep the no thing restricted for so long. So, Gaudi sought to create a holy and mystical structure to make sure that the dread's influence would terrorize Europe no more. Please continue to the next station. I looked down at the device in my hand, expecting to see some sort of error message. Instead, the text, number two, the Basilius origins, glowed back at me, just visible in the sun's glare. What was this? The dread? The no thing? Had I picked up the wrong box? What did you think? I asked Robin as we walked towards the front facade. So cool, she said. I didn't know the spies were supposed to represent Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and Jesus, but I suppose that makes sense. Right, I said. Definitely cool. We were in front of the facade now, and Robin was so excited that she began listening to the next portion without synchronizing with me. Feeling uneasy, I pressed play and brought the device to my ear. Number three, the nativity facade in the east and its corresponding passion facade to the west are crucial to keeping the dread locked in and safely under the basilia. The ancients knew that evil could be suppressed with magic but didn't possess the technological capabilities to bind that magic with the physical world, creating an effective barrier. Gaudi knew that if the no thing was to stay entombed, the Basilia would need a gate. Gaudi turned to the Nativity and Passion Gospels from the New Testament. Constructed between 1894 and 1930, the Nativity facade was the first and most important facade to be completed. As it was constructed, some workers reported hearing growls. In the center, just above the main archway, you can see the marble statue of Mary, Joseph, and the Christ child. Upon its completion, the sculptor, Francisco Olivas Oros, began to bleed from his palms. Gaudi's workers rejoiced at the sight of the stigmata before the man began to bleed from his eyes as well. He died, emaciated and drained, and was buried far away from the cursed grounds. Gaudi routinely consecrated the facade with holy water and prayer during construction. Still, at least three more men were driven mad and died at their own hand. One more, Guillem Domingo y Acosta, went missing for six days and his body eventually reappeared, inside out, next to the Barnabas statue he had helped create. At the base of each column lies a turtle and a tortoise, Ancient sources suggest the dread may fear them. Periodically, 
the front gate will spontaneously drip blood and eventually form into untranslatable runes. The Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Barcelona has a special team of exorcists in place to monitor the facade and cleanse with holy water as needed. Please continue to the next station. I stood, rooted in my spot on the pavement, the Sagrada Familia before me. Suddenly, the Basilia seemed much more sinister and imposing than before. I could see Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and the turtles that the voice described, but I could barely comprehend everything else. Hey, I think something may be wrong with my listeny thing, I said to Robin. What's wrong? Is it not saying anything? She said. For some reason, in that moment, I knew. I couldn't tell her what I had heard. This is not the kind of thing that happens. Not the kind of thing that happens to a normal person, at least. Yeah, it's just... Uh, really quiet. The lady is, like, barely audible. Hmm, that sucks. Well, let's switch listening things for the next round, then. Maybe I can hear it better. I was grateful to get the cursed objects away from me but I didn't want to let my love in whatever prank was happening here. Still, curiosity got the best of me. I wanted to know what she'd hear. Sure, I said. We entered the building for the first time, and a chill rushed through me. The sweat I had gathered on my neck from that hot summer day turned to ice. We were in a stained glass forest now. Huge, tree-like marble columns extended into the sky, and the sun worked through the glass to cast the air itself in a warm red glow. The colours inside were vibrant, to the point that they felt sinister. The arch ceiling seemed to reach just as high into the heavens as the towers outside. More statues of religious figures dotted the hive-like walls surrounding me, each of them bearing down with a level of stern urgency. The room itself seemed to be breathing, pulsating with some powerful energy. With a ping of panic, I realized that my fiancé was already listening to the haunted black box. I looked at her face to see if she was disturbed by what she heard. She did not seem to be. I began listening to my new device as well. Number 4. Materials Used Sagrada Familia is an architectural marvel. On March 19th, 1882, the first stone was laid during a ceremony hosted by the Bishop of Barcelona, Josep Urquinona. In the time since, many more stones have been placed along with some other materials that make up the beautiful, serene cathedral. First and foremost, the bell towers that were constructed during Gaudi's lifetime are made from Monduic sandstone. This device was normal. Maybe it was just a problem with mine. I thought I'd feel relieved. But what I felt instead was the still, oppressive environment around me. I looked over at Robin, and her face didn't betray any sort of surprise at what she was hearing. It seemed like she was learning about Monduic sandstone too. Hey babe, can I have my old thing back? This one sounds a little quiet to me too. It must just be my ears. I don't want you to have to deal with my sweat on the receiver. She seemed confused and a little annoyed, but she handed over my old device all the same. After I handed hers back, I resumed listening. In the end, the project is constantly evolving, and so will the materials needed to keep the dread at bay. God damn it. The device didn't even wait for me to press play again but continued on its own to the next section. Number 5. The Forest, an interior of the Basilia In prehistoric times, the Iberians would plant the tallest trees in the meadow upon which the cathedral now stands in an attempt to create a canopy to quarantine the dread's influence. It proved somewhat effective, as even though the woods came to be shunned by birds and animals, but not turtles of course, Instances of ritualistic suicides and death cults diminished through the region. But, as the Iberians died out, and new cultures took control of the area, forests were raised, and darkness spread across the continent once more. 
Gaudi paid homage to the original inhabitants of the land by constructing the pillars inside to resemble towering marble trees as their effect had undeniable impact. In recent years, the columns have come to resemble bones more as the dread slowly trickles its evil influence into the structure of the building itself. The nave is still used for occasional services today, but during the construction of the interior, workers would split into two groups, one that would work on the interior and the other to kneel at the altar and pray continuously. It is known that an idle mind is most susceptible to the no things influence, so Gaudi was careful to make sure every builder was either working or praying at all times. In a 1924 journal entry by Gaudi, he describes a tense moment in which a kneeling worker was only pretending to pray to receive a break from the demanding physical labor. While at the pew, the unnamed man burst into flames and burned down an entire section of the chamber. Please continue to the next station. I looked over to the open-aired sanctuary on the cathedral's north side. I tried to imagine the little collection of pews being devoured by flames. For a split second, I thought I had thought an inferno into existence, but it was just a sunbeam puncturing the red vein of glass from the structure's ceiling. I looked to the ceiling and caught sight of the marble's columns around me. The narrator wasn't wrong. They looked like bones now, some kind of ribcage inside the Grand Leviathan. The building felt more alive than ever before. Slightly lightheaded, I grabbed Robin's hand and frantically searched for station number six. This had to almost be over. I don't know how much more I could take. Unaware of my distress, Robin dragged me to the hallway just beyond the sanctuary, to where a sign reading six stood. As if in a trance, I clicked play once more. Number 6. The Crypt Look at the hallway's eastern wall and see if you can find a window near its base. Through this window, you can see another sanctuary, smaller than the one on the main level. Sure enough, the view from the window revealed a dimly lit sanctuary below ground. I could see quiet rows of handsome wooden pews all positioned in front of the elevated platform. On the nave, was something that seemed to resemble a gleaming white coffin. Antoni Gaudi lost his mind in the summer of 1926. As the main architect behind the project, he sustained exposure to the most constant levels of the dread's evil influence as anyone else involved. For the months preceding his death, he reported feeling more forgetful and oft depressed. In the final week, however, he would frequently break away from the medical staff and frantically dig through the earth just outside of the cathedral. He refused all food and drink and died on June 5th, 1926. It was later reported that he was struck by a tram and died in hospital to protect the man's integrity. Gaudi is entombed here in the crypt below the Sangrada Familia itself. This section is the darkest of the Basilia's chambers and is where the dread's influence is felt most acutely. Whereas it is usually safe to occupy the main level of the Basilia for several hours, the chamber below is considered unfit for human habitation and is only ever occupied for 10 minute shifts for emergency repairs. Please continue to the final station. I could not continue. In fact, I couldn't move. My eyes were riveted to the dusty white coffin in the room below. That's where Antoni Gaudi was, the man who took it upon himself to defeat the dread, or at least contain it. Wait, no, that's not real. None of this is real. I blinked, and my eyes were drifted to the pews in front of the casket. There were shadowy, human-like forms in a seated position around the pews. Suddenly, the lights in the sanctuary grew darker. I felt a hand on my shoulder and immediately screamed. Oh, are you okay, babe? Robin asked, removing her hand from my shoulder quickly. I looked around the hallway. A handful of tourists were looking at me, trying to find the source of the shriek. Yeah, I'm okay. I guess I just spaced out for a bit. 
Actually, I think I might be getting sick or something. Can we go outside? Of course, Robin said. Actually, I think that's where our tour ends anyway. How do you know? I asked. She held up a listening device, which was displaying the text, Number 7, Goodbye. As we exited the Basilia through the opposite door from which we entered, as soon as my face felt the open air again, I felt like a tremendous burden had been lifted from my shoulders. Blood and heat rushed back through my body, and my glasses fogged up. In front of us was a sign reading, Number 7. So we walked towards it and looked back up at the imposing structure. The passion facade before me was a twisting panorama of tan bones and white statues. I pressed play one last time. Number 7. Goodbye. Construction and Sangrada Familia slowed after Gaudi's death and eventually stopped altogether. The consequences were immediately apparent as influence of the no thing spread. Fascism took hold in Spain and Europe fell once again into war, eventually bringing the rest of the world along with it. Once the dread was momentarily sated with the blood of 90 million souls, a new architect, Frances Quintana, once again took up Gaudi's mission. Construction on the Passion Facade, the final piece of Sangrada Familia's sacred puzzle began in 1954. Though many of Quintana's workers reported hearing inhuman growls throughout the construction of the project, and no fewer than six more men committed suicide, the facade was structurally complete by 1974. The Nothing has been considered largely contained since 1974, though important work in Sagrada Familia of adding mystical ornamentation continues. Every day that the Basilia stands is a well-won victory against the spread of dread, though our world may never truly know peace until the holy structure is finished. Thank you for visiting Sagrada Familia. Please return your listening device to the nearest attendant. We did as we were told, and began the short walk back to the metro station. Robin was abuzz with all the exciting new facts she had learned about the symbols in the holy structure. I didn't say much. Life went on, and we returned from our trip. Vacation pictures were posted, early wedding plans were made. But sometimes, late at night, when it gets real quiet, I swear... I can hear a low buzzing, sort of like a growl. <laughs>